I suppose the one thing that got me interested in teaching at McQuaid is the fact that it is indeed a Jesuit school that has Catholic values and it instills in its young men, the students that we teach, the whole idea of service, of being intellectually capable and to definitely be men for others, which is the great school motto. McQuaid is a very uh, warm and welcoming place. I still recall the first time that I ever was walking through the corridors here at McQuaid, coming from New York City where people tend to be very cold and ignoring of one another. I was very surprised because one of the adult people in the community said, hello, I'm so-and-so, and who are you? And they introduced themselves, can I help? And it was for me uh, an experience that speaks of what McQuaid really is a place that is warm and welcoming, a place that invites people to come and to discover not only themselves and the welcome that they have, but to discover the great possibilities for themselves. One of the, the things that we hope is that when students leave here, they will be well prepared for college, that there will be a minimum level of adjustment that they'll have to make uh, to college work and they'll be able to go right to it. It's nice and it's a privilege. I get to teach a college level course to high school boys and to be able to challenge them at that level. I'll have my, my returning seniors from college you know, say to me, Mrs. Force, can you just give me that, that rhetoric handout because I'm doing this, this paper and you know, I, I, I just need to refresh the, these terms that, that you taught me. I feel that part of the college preparation that uh, goes on here is getting kids ready to enter college as thinkers, as people that are curious and willing to question and analyze uh, concepts and ideas. We really get the job done. They are prepared. They come back and they tell us, yes, I was prepared. Across the board, the students say, I, I am very prepared for, for college. That all of those papers and all of that homework and, and uh, you know, the pressure that sometimes um, made me crazy was all very much worthwhile. The goal of a Jesuit education is to form men and women of compassion, conscience, and commitment. It's a it's a, it's a program that seeks to transform the individual and society in such a way that people are recognize that the, the freedom that they have in God's grace to live lives of richness. The IPP, the Ignatian Pedagogical Paradigm, is the, the cornerstone of Jesuit education. And, um, you know, the, the foundation, it, it's, it's just good teaching. You, you set the context for the learning. You, you allow students to experience something, and hopefully it's relevant. You allow them to reflect on that experience of their education, and then hopefully they'll, they'll take it and take it to a higher level when you're evaluating. And um, hopefully you're not just asking your students to regurgitate factoids, that you're, you're asking them to, to synthesize, to enter into something creative based on that knowledge. One of the things that's very different about Jesuit education compared to other schools, because I taught previously 10 years in public schools, is there's a reflection piece. And I like it. I think even if I was ever teaching public school again, I would try to include that into my teaching because it gets kids hopefully to think about, you know, kind of the why am I learning this and what are the implications of what I've learned and everything. And it helps you kind of get to a deeper level that maybe is often forgotten. I have the unique opportunity to begin every class with a prayer. And, you know, I can hear from one boy that, you know, his dad, you know, was, was trying to, to get a promotion and let's pray for him. And then, you know, a few weeks later, you hear from that same boy during intentions at the beginning of the class, you know, my dad got the promotion and everybody's, you know, excited and just congratulating him and everything. And 
what a unique opportunity that is to, to connect and to get together. And even before you teach anything, you come together in prayer and you come together in, and you center yourselves in your hearts and then you open your minds. And for me, I, I don't think I would want to teach anywhere else. I, I can't imagine beginning a classroom from any other place than that center. When people have asked questions about, well, what's this uniform thing, or what's, what's up with the shirt and the tie? The answer is very simple. We have a dress code. It's not a uniform, per se, because you don't have every student wearing the exact same color suit jacket, the exact same color shirt with a certain monogram. It's, you need to have a suit jacket, a dress shirt, a belt, slacks or dockers or khakis, a tie, could be a necktie, could be a bow tie. You could have suspenders instead of a belt, socks, and shoes. There are some young men who you think they just won the Masters Championship because they decided to wear a green jacket. That's fine. But when you trace it back, it's the idea that historically, when men would go to work, they would wear a shirt, tie, and a jacket. The comportment of the student impacts the way that they're going to perform in the classroom. Now, that doesn't mean an, an F student becomes an A student. But what it means is when the student takes the time to say, I'm serious about how I present myself and how I look, I'm going to take other aspects of my life seriously. For example, what I'm doing in the classroom. In terms of why you know single sex or even why all boys, um, I've always been a big proponent. I did not go to a, a single sex high school myself. I went to a co-ed high school, but I've um, done a lot of reading and research in the area of single sex education, and obviously I've, I've been here for more than a decade. And I think the basic philosophy of single sex education is, is sound, that, that when you have just sort of all boys or just all girls, um, I think you minimize the distractions that the opposite you know, gender brings into the mix. And I think particularly for all boys, um, you know, there is that competitive factor when you introduce girls into the mix, that you have kind of that that machismo or that that sort of competitive air where, you know, you're competing to sort of impress the, the girls in the class. And sometimes that can lead to the kind of loudish kind of behavior that inhibits sort of you know, learning and education and, and you know, organized classroom uh, behavior. You take the classroom, and then that spills out onto the athletic field. It spills into the theater from the standpoint of guys are very comfortable, and they're going to take greater educational risks and personal risks of discovering who they are because they're not worried about the social embarrassment of, well, am I not going to look cool in front of, you know, this female student? Is she going to think I'm dumb? Because... That's completely eliminated in the academic setting. And the guy's comfort level is higher. They start to achieve more because they realize, you know what? If I look silly, it's in front of my buddies. I think you have a focus on the studies. Um, when you talk about a 14-year-old, 15, 16, on up, you talk about young men and women who the hormones have begun, their concerns about dating have begun. When you take one gender out of the equation, the students are less worried about what is she doing or what is he doing and they're more concerned about ideally what are they going to do in the next math test how are they preparing for their english exam and so on um, i think at many times it allows the students to focus in ways they would ordinarily not be able to focus um, in a co-ed situation with all boys there's also there's an esprit de corps that comes out in the learning process if you know how to tap into it and i can tell you for a fact McQuay jesuit makes it its business to make certain that the teachers here don't just teach. We teach boys. Freshmen come in from all areas. They come from Catholic schools, they come from public schools. Different experiences, different ideas. But by senior year, they, they truly are a group. It's, it's difficult to look in the McQuaid cafeteria and find a click that you might find in some public schools. You don't have the sports click, you don't have the art click, you don't have you don't have any of those things. You have a group of young men that are hanging out, talking to each other, and truly enjoying their time with each other. You're looking at a class that looks at itself as a whole, as opposed to smaller parts of a whole. There really is this brotherhood thing that goes on at this school, that I was involved in other high schools and middle schools, and even elementary schools, and 
And it's hard to say how it forms exactly or why it forms, but it clearly happens. Um, it's different. Like, I don't, I don't think I'm going to go back and visit my old high school ever. Um, and think, oh, I want to go to the high school. I'd like to work at that high school or, you know, go hang out there. But there's definitely something here that holds everybody together. And therefore, even going to like alumni golf tournaments and everything, there's this sense that, wow, I went to McQuaid. That was special. And so it's really cool that we have that. Um, I think that's because of a lot of things. It's because I think there's a longevity to the faculty and the faculty has been here for a long time. I think that this tries to become and succeeds to become more than just a school. There's service trips, there's retreats, there's this whole other part of the school that takes it beyond just being a school. I think the faculty at McQuaid Jesuit, the administration as well, the staff, all a family if you will. I know that sounds rather cliche. But quite frankly, for the past 12 years, every morning that I have gotten up at 5.15, there's a smile on my face, knowing that I'm going not to work, but I am going to a place that fosters what I love to do. And there's a community, there's a support that helps me grow in my vocation as a teacher. And I hope that in turn, I help others, my colleagues and my students, appreciate their gifts and to help hone them and to help them uh, develop as best they can. You know, it, it's interesting. I've been at McQuaid for 15 years and you would think with all these boys running around that it would be bedlam and, uh, you know, I've never approached a door in this building without it being held open for me by a student at McQuaid. And that's 15 years of, of that, that, that you get at McQuaid. And, you know, it, it just sets the place apart. And as the years go on, I think they discover the truth and the goodness about themselves, that they discover the goodness and the truth about other people. And they also discover that whether they're good or whether they're not so good, they are welcomed. They are made to feel at home. And when you're made to feel at home, what a difference it makes. And I believe that that is what, to a very large extent, the Quaid is all about. Welcoming people, letting them know they're at home, and when they know they're at home, they can indeed grow and blossom and become all that they are capable of becoming. We care about one another, we, we truly love one another, it's genuine, and we also hold each other to a higher standard from the standpoint of, hey, this is what McQuaid's about. This isn't. You make a choice. If you're going to choose to live the way that McQuaid expects you as far as your comportment, your diligence, how hard you're going to go after things, your love for humanity, your service to God and your other and your other community members, both inside and outside of McQuaid, if you're going to commit to that, McQuaid Jesuit is going to be perfect for you. And it has been perfect for so, so many young men. But you can't ignore or lo ever lose sight of or faith in just how powerful it is to be a part of something like McQuaid Jesuit. <laughs>